Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Our speaker today is Alex Grant, who's uh, stuck out of state, and he's a principal at Jade Code, Jade Code Partners. If you read his uh, bio, you'll see this is, I think, his fourth uh, clean tech startup. And uh, despite that, he was able to be named a honoree in energy 30 under 30 at Forbes magazine last year which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, I should at this point acknowledge uh, the person who suggested the last two speakers and this one, uh, Dennis Morjani. So uh, I know Alex knows him. Uh, he was a kind of early mid-career person in the class last year and has helped us a lot with you know, refining uh, topics and picking good speakers. And so far we've been extremely successful. So besides getting uh, into, into Forbes, in this talk, uh, Alex is going to describe another dimension of the uh, kind of battery ecosystem that you've heard about last week a little bit. And uh, if you were here last spring uh, from another speaker on supply chain logistics, from what I understand, Alex is a innovator in the extraction, which I think means mining and processing of lithium and uh, concerned about doing that in an environmentally sustainable way. But also, as we've heard, that could have implications for international supply chain and international security uh, issues regarding large-scale deployment, particularly of lithium-ion batteries. So I'm quite pleased to announce uh, Alex today as our speaker. It kind of fits in nicely. We will transition from our four uh, clean tech entrepreneur talks at the beginning of the quarter more to policy and systems for the next uh, few seminars. So with that said, Alex, take it away. Well, thanks so much for the intro. <clears throat> um, somehow tell me if you can't hear me correctly. Um, but um, yeah, so, so just to start off, <clears throat> the reason why I am not there in person is extremely characteristic, which is that I am working on a lithium brine exploration project in central Nevada, about <clears throat> eight hours drive from the Bay Area. And um, a bunch of schedules got mixed up. So I, uh, I was going to come back to San Francisco uh, yesterday, but uh, had had to stay an extra two days, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, that's, so yeah, that's but, for the um, audience members who think you're in the casino in Las Vegas. Good to hear you're hard at work. Oh no, yeah, definitely not at, at the casino. I'm I'm in Tonopah, Nevada. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. Um, it is a very small town, but it's it's the biggest town between Vegas and Reno. Um, so it's got a supercharger, which is kind of interesting. But um, but yeah, so I have a very, I have a very, a very good and um, yeah, char characteristic excuse. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I regret not being able to kind of you know spend time with you guys in, in Meet Space. But um, but if if anyone wants to chat later on, you know I'm very easily found on the internet. Um, so you know feel free to reach out. You know always always happy to make new friends and um, learn about what other people are working on. So um, so yeah, so that's the that's the frame. Um, I'm going to share a couple slides with you today um, that, that kind of summarizes a little bit, a little bit about how I think about lithium-ion battery supply chain impact mitigation, um, and how how to really make sure that the energy transition is as worth it, uh, really as much as possible, to make sure that the the CO2 emissions in in that new paradigm that we're building right now are are just as low as humanly possible. Um, and we're able to achieve the deepest decarbonization that you know that, that the laws of physics allow uh, without compromising our, our high quality of life in, in the next decade. Um, so, just really, there you go. So, just really, just on my background, real quick. So, I'm from Canada. I uh, did my undergrad at McGill in Montreal. Studied uh, chemical engineering and philosophy in undergrad, mostly focused on wastewater treatment and water chemistry research at universities and at startups in Montreal. Went for a PhD in chemical engineering at Northwestern in Chicago. Uh, I was kind of tired of cleaning up other people's messes doing wastewater treatment research um, and wanted to help build a new energy system. So I went to study heterogeneous catalysis for CO2 conversion to methanol as part of a solar fuels concept. And when I was when I was there, I built a high pressure, high temperature reactor, you know designed and, and built a gas chromatography machine, like really super hands-on hardcore kind of mini pilot um, development um, and, um, uh, and hated it. Um, so I was, I was really not 
well suited for academia. I was I was never going to finish my PhD, I don't think, um, and uh, you know wasn't uh, wasn't particularly happy in in, in the Midwest. Um, so I, I ended up leaving my PhD with a master's and moved to the Bay Area to co-found a technology startup called Latic Solutions. Um, so I started working on this company in early 2016. So about six six years ago now, kind of well to think. Um, and uh, that was that was kind of you know another nail in the coffin of my PhD um, was was the opportunity to go help build this company. Um, so Lilac is a lithium extraction technology company um, that uh, uh, uses kind of novel ceramic ion exchange materials to take lithium out of unconventional natural resources like low grade brines, like geothermal brines, which you may have heard about in the Salton Sea in Southern California, for example, and oil field brines and other types of resources to make lithium chemicals faster with lower, um, lower land footprint. And um, I was full-time at LADAC for about a year and a half um, kind of covered in salt, uh, building mini pilot rigs, similar to what I was doing in grad school, um, fully automated kind of robotic ion exchange systems to, uh, to test our technology on different types of brine resources, um, left just under three years ago in 2019 and, um, kind of accidentally stayed in lithium. Um, our, one of our customers just kind of wouldn't let me leave. Um, so I ended up starting my own consulting company, which is Jade Cove Partners, which is, um, still kind of my, you know, official title is, is, is principal uh, of my of my consulting company, um, and I've been consulting on lithium natural resource projects all around the world for the last three years, and um, trying to understand, <clears throat> really, really just ultimately trying to understand how can we make lithium chemicals faster from natural resources, and how do we make them better with lower CO two emissions, lower freshwater use, um, lower lower land footprint, et cetera. That's really been my, my mission the last couple of years. And a big part of what I've been doing the last couple of years, which we're going to talk a bit about today, is working with a company called Minviro in London doing life cycle assessment. <clears throat> so two years ago, we actually published the first ever life cycle assessment of lithium hydroxide manufacturing from natural resources. No one had ever published numbers on it before. And um, that became kind of a benchmark for the industry. And we've since done probably between 20 to 30 different natural resource project LCAs for making lithium chemicals. So we've built up, sorry, my mom keeps trying to call me. Um, we built up the, the best database that anyone has ever had anywhere on the CO2 emissions involved with making lithium chemicals from natural resources. Every single type of resource, every process pathway, every technology you can imagine. Um, so it's been um, a heck of a lot of fun building that building that company as well. Um, and um, kind of along the, along the side, when I, when I have time, I really like doing independent research and I really like writing. Um, so on my website, if you guys ever want to go check it out, um, I've published uh, a ton of uh, articles on different topics that I think are interesting. And um, in those publications, really what I'm doing is like kind of working through topics that I think are are true and are tr interesting or, or relevant um, to the energy transition in the lithium and natural resource space, mostly. Also, what I do is make memes. So um, if you guys follow, if anyone follows me on Twitter, you probably saw my memes already. Um, and if you are in the market for more spicy lithium and hard tech memes, uh, like I'm a one-stop shop. So, you know, just, you know, follow me on Twitter and you'll, you'll get plugged in. Um, anyways, <clears throat> this is why we're here, isn't it? So, <laughs> um, you know, September, 2020, uh, was not a very nice day in uh, in the Bay Area. Um, I'm really I'm I've been working on kind of energy and climate and water related projects for a decade, like my entire adult life. And in the last you know probably two or three years, <clears throat> two things have happened. One, acute severe kind of weather phenomena have really ramped up in a big way that I don't think anyone was expecting to happen so soon. Globally, of course, I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, but but two, people also started really caring about climate change like two years ago. Like the the the, the bankers decided we had to solve climate change in 2020 for whatever reason. Um, so now this is like an incredibly exciting space, and anyone who was already working on it is is probably uh, you know up to their up to their eyeballs in in work that, that they're doing. Um, why you know why is it why should we solve climate change? <laughs> Um, you know, climate change, I think of climate change as, um, as, as kind of a great filter kind of phenomenon. 
um, you know, climate change could really set us back hundreds or, you know, I mean, dare I say thousands of years of, uh, in terms of progress <clears throat> on our planet as a species. And I think that's really terrifying. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, so, so this is why, this is why it's so important to be working on these types of questions and, and really trying to like solve actual problems. I, I see, you know, kind of just to start talking about the thing that I'm actually talking about today. Um, I see working on decarbonization of the battery supply chain as really kind of like a, like a 22nd century type problem. Like, you know, we, we kind of just got the world over, over the, the hump of electrifying transport and, you know, uh, try, trying to now make a lot of batteries. Um, I, I use the word try, um, cause it is of course very hard, but, um, but, but going all the way back up to the mine and, and pulling out all the fossil fuel infrastructure all the way back up to mine, up, up to the mine is, um, is, is, is really like so much harder than building a, a battery pilot plant in, in, in Fremont or whatever have you. Um, like it is, it is such a, it is such a gigantic global, like multi-stakeholder task. Um, and it's, it, it's really, it's really just like a subset of decarbonizing industry in general. Right. And decarbonizing, Kind of all of industry is really important because it underpins our high quality of lives, right? Like it's it's us rich people in rich countries who are mostly driving climate change. Um, so we need to be able to like produce the things that that we need, whether it's materials or energy or whatever have you, in a way that that isn't isn't making this happen anymore. Um, so, anyways, <clears throat> this is a quote I stole from JV Strubble um, from a talk he gave. Uh, at, on campus in 2020, I thought it was a great quote. So he said. The embodied emissions of the materials that used to make batteries are significant and need to be understood. If you were to power all your EV manufacturing using coal, it would make no difference at the end of the day. One thing we did when we built the Gigafactory was to make it all electric. There's literally no natural gas line. So there's little to no local emissions at that factory. When, we, when you weave natural gas to your facility, it makes it much harder to chase it out. The emissions all the way back up to the minor significant too. When we look at terawatt hour scales of production, we need to make sure we are not creating unintended consequences as we go through the industrial shift. That is why we are in the situation in the first place and we need to rapidly remediate that. So in this presentation, I'm gonna use this quote as kind of a template for jumping off of um, on each of these five different points. Um, so so why, why do the embodied emissions of Valerie metals matter? Um, they, they are quantitatively objectively important. Um, if you run an LCA on a, on a, on a lithium ion battery. So most LCAs I've seen of a lithium ion cell compared or a kind of an electric vehicle on whatever grid compared to um, an internal combustion engine shows something like 50 to 75% decarbonization for the EV versus an ICE vehicle. Um, that's honestly like not as good as you would expect you know, I, I mean, maybe other people have different expectations, but um, we're, it's, it's, it's going to be a heck of a lot of work to, to kind of overhaul all of our, trans, our transport infrastructure. And it seems like kind of, um, kind of sad to be doing it for only, you know, cutting the CO2 emissions of transport by half. Um, part, of, part, of, part of why the emissions of the kind of EV from, from you know, cradle, cradle to grave or kind of wherever you want to cut off your accounting um, is due to the, the materials used to make the battery. Um, and of course, other materials in the car, like aluminum and stuff. Um, and something, something we have found doing life cycle assessment of battery metals and Enviro is that um, the, the embodied CO2 emissions of making these chemicals from different types of resources in different ways with different types of energy inputs can vary tremendously. Mm -hmm. So there are lithium hydroxide products you can buy today that have kind of a you know, 9x difference in their embodied CO2 emissions. Um, that's massive. So those, those high embodied emission products kind of you know, hurt the, um, the, the, CO2, the overall CO2 mitigation opportunity of the electric vehicle um, because we're emitting CO, so much CO2 upstream and shift, shifting the environmental burden, if you will. Um, so... If you were to choose like just kind of dirty, you know, honestly, quite typically Chinese battery metals um, versus kind of cleaner, lower carbon ones, the delta 
in a, an MC811 cell of the embodied CO2 emissions would be 55 kilos of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Um, at three terawatt hours per year, that's equal to the, the CO2 emissions of um, Ireland, Switzerland, and Portugal combined. And that's just the difference in the embodied CO2 emissions of battery metals, not even the aluminum in the car. Um, so that's really significant. <laughs> um, and for context, you know, you might not have any good data points in your mind about like what this is, is 55 kilos of CO2 per kilowatt hour high or, or, or low. Um, there are battery manufacturers who say that they're going to have an embodied emissions of 10 kilos of CO2 per kilowatt hour in their batteries by 2030. Um, that's basically unachievable, and it's definitely not achievable if they don't decarbonize their supply chains. And there's there's kind of a um, really interesting conclusion here that I've I've kind of more operationalized over the last couple of years, which is to realize that really the power to choose those battery metals that goes into the EVs that the rest of us drive is in the hands of a very small group of people, uh, just a couple companies. Um, so um, you know, help, helping people understand this is really important for, for the people making those decisions of what metals to buy. This is <laughs> okay. So. Quote, Quote, quote sub subsection number two, um, if you were to power all your EV manufacturing using coal, it would make no difference at the end of the day. Um, this, uh, you know, the, uh, this, this, di this, I, I can't, I can't think of any word besides meme because I call everything a meme now. Um, this, this meme here um, is from a sustainability report of a Chinese lithium company. Um, I find it very funny that uh, if you compare 2018 to 2019, uh, embodied emissions of their lithium carbonate equivalent lithium chemical product, they um, they reduced at 0.9 percent, um, and and the the bars uh, look like you know at least five percent, maybe almost ten percent of the delta, um, and and this this meme was originally green, and I I removed the color because I didn't think it was appropriate to use the color green um, for to to talk about you know how much how much coal and how much energy they're using to make their lithium chemical. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that there's an absolute, like, massive quantity of greenwashing happening in this space, um, and it's it's pretty troubling. Um, does it go all the way to the top? I don't know, but um, you know, in, in in the lithium ion battery supply chain, there there has historically been a tremendous amount of kind of deception and and greenwashing. So I'm, I guess I'm kind of used to it now. But um, you know, it, it, I just find it really important to like make sure we are actually talking about things like accurately, right? That's been a big part of a lot of my publications and a lot of my work. Um, you know, te Tesla does not buy lithium hydroxide from Australia, like hasn't bought one gram of lithium hydroxide from Australia. You know, it all comes from China. Um, and it all comes from that lithium producer in China who's burning quite a bit of coal um, to make lithium hydroxide. Um, I'll skip this because I don't want to go into it, but <clears throat> basically, I, th I think that emphasis on minimizing CO2 emissions and decarbonization is it kind of has geopolitical, um, you know, kind of tangents associated with it. But you know, that's that's another day. Sorry for another day. Um, so the Nevada Gig Factory has no natural gas line. Once you once you start assuming you can use fossil fuels in a in a battery metal production process, um, it, it gets a lot harder to um, to decarbonize it if you're kind of locking yourself in, right? Um, so, so it's really it's really critical that people who are who are designing and operating battery metal plants, like lithium chemical plants, for example, like mines, chemical plants, etc., um, need to be very deliberate about the technical decisions they make to achieve decarbonization goals. It's easy it's easy enough to to greenwash and lie in sustainability reports, um, but eventually, you know, I, I hope I hope at least that it doesn't work forever. Um, and I and I hope at least that investors start to kind of take it more seriously, and and I and I and I, and I also hope that you know eventually regulators take it more seriously as kind of um, as, as a kind of a securities violation, to be honest, right? Um, but, um, but really, really, like instead of getting stuck in a, in a by violating securities laws and, and having a whole you know a, a heck of a lot of problems for for management, um, it, it's just easier to to instruct the engineers to try to minimize their fossil fuel use in their, in their operation um, and, and, and really make deliberate decisions um, to, to do that, right? Um, just one example of kind of now, now, I guess in a modern sense, kind of a easy way to decarbonize heat, for example, is to use 
mechanical vapor recompression for for steam and for thermal processing, um, which which is useful for a, for a range of, of thermal processes for converting lithium chemicals and making other battery metals. Because really, really, what it does is it, it makes it so that instead of burning coal or natural gas to generate all of the steam that you would use in a in a chemical process, you're now probably ninety to ninety five percent powering steam generation with electricity, which can be much more easily decarbonized than a fossil fuel. The emissions all the way back up to the mine are significant. Um, the mining industry actually knows this. So the mining industry takes decarbonization relatively seriously in a way that I don't think oil and gas does. Um, and the reason why is because it is, it is fundamentally possible to decarbonize mining. So mining does not need to emit CO2 in the process of extracting minerals from the earth and, and refining them. Um, a, great, a great example is electric mining trucks. So a lot of, a lot of underground mining is already electric. Um, so it, it's not at all a new idea um, to, to, to electrify, you know, transport of ore in, in a mine. Um, and, um, you know, uh, kind of some, cause some types of mining operations that currently are mostly powered by diesel um, will, will eventually be electrified, whether that's through green hydrogen or, or directly with batteries. Um, and I think it'd be pretty cool if it was directly with batteries and you're mining lithium with a lithium mine battery powered truck. It'd be kind of like the lithium's mining itself. Um, so this, this stuff's happening, you know, it could, it could happen a, a lot faster. Um, but, um, I, um, I, I, I just want to make the point that like, you know, the mining industry is, is taking this relatively seriously, but there's still, there's still a lot of work to do. And you, you really have to, you really have to choose decarbonization if, if you if you want it. So what happens when, what happens when we scale up the battery industry? Um, and, um, and, and, and it's dependent on, on coal or, you know, kind of legacy processes that are less efficient or whatever have you. If you think about, if you think about that Delta CO2 that I mentioned earlier between kind of a high embodied emissions bill of materials versus a low embodied emissions bill of materials, um, that, that Delta is almost as, is, is basically as large as the entire rest of the, uh, uh, of the CO2 emissions associated with making the battery. So it's, it's huge. Just kind of purchasing decisions can make a huge difference. Um, I, um, I've been kind of like screaming this from the rooftops for the last two years, um, trying to kind of convince battery and EV industry stakeholders to, to take this seriously. Um, part of the issue here that I've noticed over the last couple of years is that EV companies and battery companies um, are, are, are not mining companies and they don't understand mining and chemical processing for the most part. Um, and what that means is that kind of the EV industry and the battery industry, which has actually relied on LCA for probably at least a decade to understand the CO2 mitigation impact of making electric vehicles compared to ICE vehicles, has been dramatically underestimating the embodied emissions of raw materials, simply because they didn't know kind of what data to collect, really. Um, and they didn't know how to kind of due diligence on their suppliers to understand if numbers were right or not. Um, so the, the result is that most database values for doing life cycle assessment on batteries are, are, are extremely inaccurate. Um, but, um, but kind of database values aside, every single battery bill of materials will be different, right? So if I'm a, if I'm a Tesla or a Volkswagen, I could theoretically have completely different suppliers of lithium hydroxide and that hydroxide can be made in completely different ways. So it's important to kind of take like an asset by asset supplier by supplier look at embodied emissions and, um, and, and, and kind of make sure that that priority to decarbonize and track emissions kind of goes, goes all the way back up to the mine. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's kind of shocking, but like it, it, it almost like doesn't matter if you completely decarbonize or completely carbon neutralize a, a battery manufacturing process um, or, or, or even, or even cell assembly is not even that important. If, if you if you don't pay a lot of attention to the sourcing of your raw materials, it gets completely you know dwarfed by the embodied emissions of those materials. Um, yeah, so I this was this was more more geared towards the the the, the lithium industry, but um, really the the place that this comment was coming from, um, you know why why would um, why would an EV company care about um, 
you know, lithium mining CO2 emissions. Um, the, re the, reason why, the reason why I talk about this pretty often is because in the mining industry, people used to not take upstream scope three very seriously. So if I was using sodium hydroxide in a process, for example, I would not report it in my CO2 emissions accounting. Um, but that's um, that's not really a complete way to look at things. Like you have you have to understand your upstream scope three at least um, in 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 kind of CO two accounting um, processes. Um, really quickly, a couple of little case studies. So there are there are reasons to think that the embodied CO two emissions of making lithium chemicals, for example, is actually going up. So in the last couple of years, there's been a shift to making lithium hydroxide from from Australian hard rock process in China. Um, and that is um, that is typically higher CO2 intense than um, than, than a Chilean brine evaporation process, for example. But um, but there's there's so there's the reasons to think that, that the, those embodied emissions numbers can continue going up because um, because grade and impurity profiles of new natural resources that we're tapping into to make lithium chemicals are are kind of declining, right? As as you develop and produce a lot of lithium from natural resource assets that are that are already existing, you, you obviously can't expand them dramatically. You have to tap into new resources. Um, so if you have a kind of lower grade or higher impurity concentrations, you need to plow more energy and more materials into the system to, to extract that lithium and make a lithium chemical. But, um, but there's lots of interesting ideas of how to reduce emissions as well. Uh, geothermal lithium is one. So this, this is the idea of building a geothermal energy plant Kind of combined and co-developed with lithium extraction uh, to make lithium chemicals using direct lithium extraction process. Um, so that's um, th those are super interesting projects. The the two main kind of hubs for geothermal lithium historically has been Southern California and the Upper Rhine Valley in Germany and France. Um, but uh, but there's activity going on all around the world on geothermal lithium, um, and then. A second little mini case study to share with you is um, the sedimentary clay natural resources that you can find all the way from the border of Oregon down all the way into Mexico, all across Nevada. There are probably uh, like hundreds of millions of tons of lithium carbonate equivalent stored in clays um, across the Western United States. Um, there's a couple there's a couple projects that are that are in later stages of development, like Thacker Pass in northern Nevada and Rylate Ridge in central Nevada, kind of close to where I am right now. Um, these, these, these sedimentary minerals are processed using mostly direct sulfuric acid bleaching. And there's, there's, there's one little issue when you do that, which is that sedimentary clay minerals tend to have a lot of carbonate minerals kind of mixed in with them. So if those carbonates are not removed, you end up uh, liberating quite a bit of CO2 when you acidify um, the carbonates mixed in with that mineral. Um, this this is something I'm I'm a little bit nervous about. Um, I I'm actually not working on many sedimentary clay lithium projects anymore because I I find this this problem um, very challenging and semi semi intractable, especially for lower grade resources. Um, so um, this is you know this this really like underlines for me the importance of kind of understanding drivers of CO2 emissions in a lithium chemical extraction process um, and and using life cycle assessment to. Um, to make sure what really matters, because one of these projects could be acidifying a whole bunch of carbonates and releasing, you know, 30 kilos of CO2 per kilo of lithium carbonate, but but uh, but have electric mining trucks and and call themselves carbon neutral or something like this. Um, that would be, of, of course, completely deceptive. Um, a lot of coal is still used in making lithium chemicals. Um, I think it would be cool if we stopped using coal and making in lithium chemicals and and all battery metals for that matter. Um, I uh, I, I I kind of want I want someone to like start a a movement or something to weed coal out of the battery supply chain because um, I think it's absolutely bonkers that this is kind of still going on in 2022. Um, so so just to summarize, uh, you know, if we're gonna kind of get past the great filter and you know be a more advanced alien species and and develop kind of a 22nd century um, battery metal supply chain. Uh, everyone has kind of a part to play. So, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about kind of the role of, that engineers and, and technologists have here um, because I because I am one of those people. Um, uh, so, you know, won't go, won't go too much into detail there. But um, but I would I would I would also kind of really emphasize the importance of of investors taking this seriously and kind of investing some time and energy and understanding embodied emissions of battery metals. Um, I think it would be fabulous if. Uh, if if there was some kind of moratorium uh, 
uh, in investing in, in high CO2 intense battery metals. Um, I know that's totally impossible. I mean, no one's going to do that, but, um, but, but obviously, you know, buyers of these chemicals do have some sway over, over which chemicals end up there in their battery. Um, and, um, and yeah, I just, I just think like kind of all, all of these different stakeholders across the, the battery supply chain have to be using life cycle assessment to understand the embodied CO2 emissions of their product. Um, and, and make the right decisions about about decarbonization to to achieve real decarbonization. Um, so yeah, that's um, you know that, that's that's what I would say about that. So um, so yeah, that's it. Um, that's all I have to say. I uh, welcome your questions. Um, if anyone wants to chat later on, um, you know, feel free to reach out. You have my email here. Um, I'm, I'm very reachable. I might, I might, I might not have time to chat, um, but, but um, you know, uh, feel free, feel free to reach out, and hopefully we can link up at some point. So, great. Uh, thanks, Alex, for that great um, uh, talk regarding your work. I actually find myself wondering exactly what you're doing there, but you probably can't talk about about that in about a. It, as a classic rocker, your theme could be could be uh, the old Who song, Don't Be Fooled Again. Is that kind of, if I get your drift here? I don't think you're, yeah. you're solving a problem that you might not actually be solving. I um yeah no what am I what am I doing here so um I'm I'm involved with the lithium brine exploration project so um you know I'm I'm an engineer I've worked on like tech startups like living in a city kind of person um I n I never thought I would be involved with such an early stage project like this like literally the problem set that we're working on right now is shooting like sound waves into the earth to figure out where salty water might be. And kind of in, in what thicknesses and 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 how extensive in kind of X Y and then how many different aquifers you can find all the way down and then um, in in two weeks from now probably on Valentine's Day we're gonna we're gonna poke a hole and um, that'll be the first time that we'll know the actual geochemistry kind of as you go down into the earth which is really what matters you can take surface samples easy peasy but um we're gonna we're gonna have to drill about a kilometer deep to to understand you know where lithium could be um kind of going all the way down and and, and start to understand how much lithium there could be in this particular um exploration target and to understand if we have higher enough grade to extract it economically and, and, and build an actual operation that could make lithium chemicals um, uh, that could go in straight into a cathode uh, for a lithium ion battery. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's literally crazy. You know, like this company I'm involved with is investing hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars actually, to drill holes in a salty pile of mud to see if there is lithium there. We don't even know how much lithium is there. We don't even know if it's a project yet. Um, so, um, so you know, I, I think it's a lot of fun. I like being out in the desert. I think it's really fun being out here. Um, but um, but it's a, it is a truly like, the, like un, kind of unprecedented like exercise. Like not very many people have worked on anything like that before where it's so risky, um, so bonkers. I mean, it's just, it's just, yeah, totally kind of crazy project. Um, but I find that a lot of fun. So. Okay, if anyone has questions, I'll just bring you the microphone so we can hear you. So I was tr intrigued. I guess I see the solution to this problem being entrepreneurs like you on the one hand and other players, um, particularly struck the last few years, as you indicated, by the buy-in from the financial um, community, uh, finance, banking, insurance, and whatnot. And I know even there are, you probably know this, some um, really recently rolled up um, investment funds that have a sustainability index kind of way of valuing investments in their portfolio. So the question for me is, are you talking to those guys? I could see them trying to do kind of um, quick quick, uh, simple life cycle, but not going as deeply as you, to what extent are you communicating with that community already? Um, so the, uh, the investor sphere is vast, right? It goes way beyond Silicon Valley. I mean, it goes way beyond New York. Um, there are so many people I could be talking to who I'll never be able to talk to who control significant quantities of capital. Um, which is partly why I publish actually really is to, 
to try to scale up my my, my message and my work, right? Um, but um, and I talked to them. Yes, a couple. So like, you know, one of my one of my LCA clients uh, is is building a um, a spodumene mineral mine in Brazil, and um, she she has uh, BlackRock as I think her her largest investor in in her company. Um, building the spodumene mine to make to make spodumene concentrate for conversion to lithium hydroxide, and um, BlackRock, BlackRock has solicited CO two emission data from my client, um, and I've helped kind of you know essentially fill in the Excel sheet of what BlackRock wants, right? So I've I've had some experience um, kind of feeding data uh, kind of down the chain to to investors um, to help them understand kind of what my what kind of what my clients co2 profiles look like um i've, I've got i've got on my to-do list for tomorrow or, or the day after um f- filling out a kind of a co2 emission profile for for a major european auto manufacturer um so um so i i, I have in contact with a couple of really i mean globally relevant um significant uh, names um and um, I, I can tell you that really the most sophisticated folks are mostly asking like you know, pretty much the right questions. Um, so, so most of the major European auto manufacturers have internal lifecycle assessment teams already. They do. They do. They build their own LCA models. Like it's like a, a little academic department within within the the Renaults and the Volkswagens of the world. Um, and that's actually like I mean I find really interesting. So I've been helping those types of folks. Better understand battery metal processing because what why we've been so successful doing life cycle assessment in this space is that uh, is because I'm a chemical engineer. We have mining engineers on staff. We have geologists on staff. Like we're deeply technical in the natural resources sector, um, and and kind of legacy LCA practitioners don't have that, so they haven't been able to um, to catch up with us, I guess. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, sorry, long winded answer, but but yes, you know I am chatting to those types of folks. Um, I. Uh, I wish they would, um, I wish, well, I mean, I don't know. I've been uh, kind of surprised on the upside in the last like year or two about the, about capital allocation decisions to low carbon projects, I have to admit, in lithium at least. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty excited and optimistic to be honest, but um, but I, I'm, I'm sure there's always more kind of permeation of these ideas into into the investor sphere that would be helpful. Um, and um, and yeah, actually, you know, you know what? One interesting comment to share before I stop talking. Um, Something I've something I've noticed people chatting about in in kind of in these topics of like natural resource decarbonization and um, and and kind of an investor kind of responsibility to investors of, of reporting CO two emissions and such is um, poor performing assets like coal mines and things like that are being shifted into the private sector. So private companies are buying coal mines and. Um, and kind of natural resource assets that have environmental issues, and then just continuing to operate them because they're not accountable to um, to as many investors as public companies are, and they're they're not as scrutinized. So that's something I'm a little bit worried about, actually, um, just to kind of tamper down my optimism. Um, and and those private companies don't care about optics or having a cute sustainability report. Like they are just trying to make money. Um, so yeah, that's that's something to like kind of keep. Keep an eye on, I guess. Okay, any questions in the room here? One more. So I'll try another one. So you started with this book with J.B. Strobel and Tesla, and you got back into Tesla. Now that Tesla's up about a trillion dollars in market cap, are you still working with them? And if so, what's the take? I actually have a friend who did with J.B. an early EV versus internal combustion engine life cycle comparison. And that was pretty advanced in the day, maybe five, seven years ago, but not as advanced yeah. as you're talking about here. So are you continuing to work with people like that? Um, so I'm not, no, I just stole JB's quote. That's a great quote. I haven't <laughs> met JB in person yet. I've had a couple of interactions with him. Um, <laughs> but um, but I uh, I don't know, can I, I haven't signed an NDA, I guess. But, um, you know, I was I was up at their offices like two, two or three days ago chatting about LCA just casually. Um, so... Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not working with them directly, but I, I understand that kind of sophisticated folks like Redwood and, and Tesla and, and the Volkswagens of the world are, are taking life cycle assessment very seriously, um, principally because they actually do care about decarbonization for the most part. But um, it's, it's also going to it's, it's also very soon going to be the law of the land in Europe. 
to, to have much more sophisticated carbon emission disclosures on, on products sold in the European Union. Um, so they're going to be forced to take life cycle assessment very seriously. Um, so I'm not, yeah, I'm less, I'm kind of almost, now. I'm now over the last few years less worried about the, the Teslas and the Redwoods and the Volkswagens of the world. Um, I, I think I think those types of folks are are doing a pretty solid job on on tracking their supply chain CO2 emissions. So, yeah, Europe's Europe's been big on this, particularly on the finance issue. You probably know the people running the European Climate um, uh, Investor uh, Disclosure Process were the same people that the UK uh, government uh, hired to analyze the financial crisis in 08 and 09, and they were asked at the end of that, "What's the next big thing?" And this is what they picked. Essentially, uh, financial disclosure uh, regarding both uh, transition risk and uh, physical risk to companies that people are investing in. Yeah. So I think I think you may again might might find some good allies there as well. Well, I I just I think greenwashing should be a securities violation, right? Yeah, yeah. A lie, a lie yeah. to a lie to investors is a lie to investors, yeah. regardless of what it's about, right? Yeah. And especially if it's related to climate and environmental impacts that a company incurs in making its product, investors need accurate information on that to make decisions yeah. um, because of because of near future compliance reasons and, you know, just, you know, morals or you know, whatever have you. Um, so, oh, you know, I mean, oil, you know, oil and gas companies are having the hardest time of, of, of anyone, right? Um, they're they're really squirming. But um, yeah, no, I just, uh, the, amount, the amount of greenwashing in the world is, is really incredible. You know, like you see things like, um, you see things like blue hydrogen, right? Like I'm, I'm very, I'm very anti blue hydrogen. I think it's an absolute like scam. And just for context, if anyone doesn't know, like blue hydrogen, so 95% of hydrogen today is made from fossil fuels, right? From, from coal or natural gas. Um, and um, blue hydrogen is this idea of making hydrogen from, natural gas and then capturing the CO2 and storing it in the subsurface. Um, I see blue hydrogen as, as an opportunity simply to kind of retain the value of natural gas assets, like natural resource assets in the share prices of oil and gas companies. Um, that is by far the best explanation of why anyone would want to produce blue hydrogen. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just like shocked by how, how often blue hydrogen is kind of gets away with calling itself clean. And, you know, there's McKinsey reports where, you know, blue hydrogen is labeled as, as, as clean hydrogen and kind of lumped with green hydrogen made from water and renewables. And um, it's a crime, really, it's a crime because the CO2 emissions in um, that, that would result from making hydrogen that could be captured and sequestered um, are not tracked today, right? So today when they make hydrogen, they're just dumping it all in the atmosphere. And um, and the methane emissions in the in the well field of conducting that natural gas from the subsurface to the blue hydrogen plant or whatever plant you know you, you, whatever you're doing with the natural gas are also not really tracked very well. So there's there's just no there's no there's no compliance reason to do blue hydrogen right. Um, and blue hydrogen is just one example. I mean, there's lots of examples like that where it's it's so obvious that someone's gonna someone's gonna call a product clean or green and that's gonna end up being a, a disaster uh, in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, and a lot of folks are kind of like sleepwalking into this because um, they because they don't really understand like the drivers of CO2 emissions and they and they kind of over trust companies who, who just make kind of simple declarations, right? So yeah, lots of lots of emotions about um, about greenwashing and, um, and, and you know, th those topics. Um, I take it very personally, really. Yeah. So. Well, hang in there. I do, I do think there may be some win-wins in here, but if we don't have the right uh, accounting framework and full transparency, we're not going to even see those. So I do agree with that part of it. There's no kind of simple way to do it. It's it's equally hard uh, to what you're doing to make sure that the, the bit that you allow is actually going to get you to a better place through the big uh, transition. Yeah. So, any other comments in the room? I think we can now adjoin. Oh, yes, sir. You want to run? Stand one sec. Doing it right. And who's uh, trying to do it better for decarbonizing? For, de for decarbonizing the, the like li like lithium chemicals or decarbonizing what? 
Uh, just like the battery making process in general, I'm thinking more like specifically towards like EV, EV car, like EV cars. Well, um, I think my clients are doing things right, obviously, but I'm biased. Of course. Um, one. <laughs> huh? Can you say who they are? John's asking, can you uh, say specifically? I'm, I'm trying to think if any of any of my 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 cathode or cell LCA clients are public. Um, one one that's public is um, is named Frayer. Uh, so they're building a uh, they're building an uh, an LFP. They're they're building a cell plant in Norway, um, which has a very clean grid. So they're off to a good start. But um, but yeah, so we're we're helping them with with LCA on their on their cell manufacturing process. Um, that's just one of probably five different cathode or cell uh, companies that we're working with at the moment that are they're all that are otherwise confidential. Um, I will, um, you know, I, I hinted at one person, uh, one company that was making kind of tenuous uh, claims and has um, kind of tenuous expectations for their body emissions. Um, and I, I, might, I might as well just name them because there's, I, I, I don't really lose anything in, in, in not in, in naming them. Um, uh, Northvolt in, in Sweden, um, North, Northvolt is, is the company that, um, while well, they're planning to make, to make cells for, uh, for for European auto manufacturers, kind of in the next five to ten years, and um, Northvolt has published a target of to total embodied emissions of ten kilos of CO two per kilowatt hour of storage in their cell. Um, I was showing you like I was showing you kind of some of the orders of magnitude of of kind of kilos of CO two per kilowatt hour of raw materials versus cell manufacturing, et cetera, and. Um, you know, based on those numbers, where probably the average right now is something like seventy-five to hundred kilos of CO two per kilowatt hour um, for, for, for a lithium-ion battery. Um, you know, that's uh, you know almost an order of magnitude higher than than their target. And um, I, I I'm not aware of of Northvolt publishing relationships with any low carbon battery metal producers or developers for that matter. Um, so so. Today, I've seen no evidence that Northfold is doing anything to to promote production of, of low carbon battery metals, and um, and I, I'm you know I just find that disappointing to be honest. Like I'm sure I'm sure they've kind of got their heads on right. You know I'm sure I'm sure that they you know I they have an LCA team, so that I I know that they they must know roughly at least the, the kind of drivers of emissions of making their product. But um, but what I'm not seeing is their procurement team kind of putting the pedals of the metal and like. You know, signing actual contracts to buy actual low carbon uh, metals and chemicals. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's just kind of like a disappointment name, I guess. Um, so, who's you know, you asked me who's doing it right. Um, I think I think my clients I think my clients are doing things right. Um, so, you know, hire me to do your LCAs. But um, <laughs> I'm jo joking, joking. Um, I. You know, if I had to like kind of go through the list, I don't know if that's interesting to you guys. Maybe that's excessive, but like m most of them are are like kind of doing it right, but like not really. Um, but most of them don't, as I said a couple minutes ago, like most of them don't fully really understand the embodied emissions of their of their cell bill of materials. So it's impossible to do it right if, if you don't understand that. Um, so um, yeah, I don't I don't know if anyone's really doing it like. Per perfectly or you know kind of up to my expectations and that's okay um ho hopefully hopefully some some more of them kind of get there in the next couple of years but uh yeah so it's a bit it's a bit of, it's a it's a bit of a mess um. <laughs> okay alex at this point we're just about out of time here so we'll transition to the up close personal student session thanks very much for sharing your story with you i think it's a very very important one going forward with the clean clean energy transition Thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, sorry again, couldn't be there. Got you know stuck out here in the desert, but um, you know, again, if anyone ever wants to chat, you know, feel free to reach out. So, well, you'll get a few right now. Cool. Okay. Bye. <laughs>